React India. It is great to be back to React India this time online. And we're here to discuss a little bit of the computer science behind fibers and behind React. So this is me, I am Matheus Albuquerque. You can find me everywhere as Wide Combinator, including Twitter. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Medallia, a mentor at Tech Labs Berlin, and a Google Developer Expert in the area of performance. Uh, the link for the slides uh, of the session is available on this QR code as well as other links about me and etc. So before we start, I'd like to share a little bit of context behind the session, what motivated me and etc. So a couple of years ago, a friend of mine, Bruno, was working on this proposal for bringing algebraic effect handlers to JavaScript. And he basically asked me for some feedback on the proposal and etc. And the thing is, when I was reading it, I found a lot of uh, terminology I wasn't 100% familiar with. And that included, for example, generator threads, etc. But also fibers, continuations, algebraic effects, coroutines, and a lot of other things. So I started diving a little bit into those uh, words and uh, what they meant. And that's the proposal of the session, to put it in a way that it makes sense and how they all piece together uh, in the realm of React. So, of course, let's start with fibers. And to be honest, um, I love the idea of stack frames to understand fibers. So let's say we have this JavaScript function uh, add that takes two parameters x and y and basically returns the, the sum of them. So, and then we invoke it with add two and two. So if we were to have a stack frame for that, it would look something like this, uh, where we have the return, the frame, and then we have our function being add, some parameters, two and two, and as local variables, we have the result of that that is four. Uh, if we think a little bit about fibers, uh, we can have something similar for a React component, where we return a fiber, uh, instead of a function, we have a component, let's say an avatar. Instead of parameters, we have props. And instead of local variables, we have some state that can be state from a hook or some state from a class component, etc. And that's kind of how we can summarize. So Fiber as an architecture model is this React-specific implementation of a call stack alike thing that gives React full control of scheduling what should be done. And a fiber on its own is this sort of a stack frame for a given component. So now we can start abstracting those as units of work. So let's recap a bit uh, what happens with our component. So once the template goes through the JSS compiler, we have a bunch of elements and then during reconciliation, the data from all of these elements that is returned from the render method is merged into this tree of different fiber nodes. And of course, depending on the type of the element, uh, React needs to perform different activities. For example, so that's a class component or a functional component or a for child or uh, uh, etc. Because of that, each element is then converted into a fiber node that is going to describe exactly what work React needs to perform. So that's how we can kind of think, okay, that's a unit of work. And that is exactly what makes it very convenient for React to track, schedule, pause, and abort uh, any kind of work. If you're more interested in learning about the anatomy of a fiber and other different concepts, I would definitely recommend you to check this book called Fluid React by Tejas Kumar. It's going to be released um, in the next couple of months, I would say, and there's a lot of valuable information there. But moving forward, we discussed that these are units of work, so it's probably a good idea that we try to visualize them so that we get a better grasp. So let's start with our first experience in the session, inspect, inspecting some elements. So here 
Uh, I have this very, very simple React app with some information writer and an increment and decrement button. And that's how it looks. So but, uh, as it increment and decrement, uh, it changes the number in the screen. And you can see in the console that I'm inspecting a fiber node and there are many uh, fields with meta information, including, for example, props, state, child, uh, lanes, uh, siblings, and a lot more. So based on what we saw here from this con from the console, we can write some code. Here we have a JavaScript map and we are iterating through uh, our fiber nodes and checking siblings, children, etc. and adding that to our uh, JavaScript map. So you can see that I'm here using just some of the huge amount of meta information I have from an element. So I'm just using things like child, sibling, return, and etc. So let's copy this code and paste to the console of an actual app. So here I have twitter.com and I just pasted the code and let's first see our fiber map. So you can see that, for example, Twitter has almost 3.5 thousand class components. Uh, that's something interesting. But another thing we can start doing is to pick a random component in the screen and mark that as the current element. So that then we can do fibers map dot get and then print uh, dollar sign zero so that we have the current element. And you can see that you will get the same amount of metadata uh, we got from the previous example. Again, if you're interested in figuring out more about the anatomy of a fiber, you can check the source of the reconciler where you have documentation on which of these fields, uh, what each of these fields are, for example, what is a tag, what is the key, what is the element type and so on. And another thing very, very interesting for you to check out also within the reconciler are the different kinds of components that React marks internally. So you can have, for example, classic stuff like function component, class component, and etc. But you can also have context consumer, context provider, a profiler, an offspring component. And like, as you can see, the list is huge. It's more than 20 different kinds of tags that it's basically 20 different ways of React marking uh, this, this component. Okay, now that we have a better idea of what these uh, units of work look like, we can also talk about manipulating them. So for that, I'd like to ask you if you're familiar with the idea of homoeconicity. If you're not, um, let's grab one example in Lisp. So basically in this code, uh, we, it's nothing complex. We have a temporary binding where we're basically saying x is one. And then here we're incrementing x to give the return value of two. What's interesting about this code is here we have a list with three elements. First, we have a symbol that is named let. And then we have a vector with two elements being one of them, a symbol that is x and an integer. And then we have a list with two elements being one of them a symbol that is increment and X as the other symbol. So if we grab the definition of homoeconicity from Wikipedia, for example, we'll see that this is a property of some programming languages in which the code used to express a program is written using the data structures of that language. So, if we think about React, we just saw that those React elements we have, they're just data. So just like in Lisp or other languages where we have homoeconicity, uh, React components, they can manipulate their children and return something that is very different. So that takes us to our second experiment that is bringing pattern matching to React. So again, um, if you're not familiar with pattern matching, I do like the definition from this Haskell book that is really good. So pattern matching consists of specifying patterns to which some data should conform and then checking to see if it does and deconstructing the data according to those patterns. So it's easier if we can visualize. So I have two examples here. The first one is implementing the factorial function in Haskell. So first we have the type annotation 
and then we define the base case where we have uh, where we handle one, zero, and then we match against any value, and then we do the recursive call. A similar example, but with an extra case, would be the Fibonacci uh, sequence. So again, we define the type annotation of that function, and then we handle the base case. We handle the, uh, we match against zero, and then we match against one, and then for everything else, we go with the recursive call. So what am I talking about? Pair matching and React. So here's an example where we're grabbing some uh, information from an API. And then we're passing this uh, uh, to, then we have this hook that is use pattern match and this hook is giving us three components, match with and otherwise. And what we're doing is we're matching this against the results of our use API request. So for example, if we get an error, we render the error result. But if we get an okay, and that's the type image, we're gonna render our image. And if we get an OK and the data conforms to the type text, we're going to render our text. And you can see everything is typed and etc. So what's interesting here is that this hook and these components uh, we just saw, they're, they, this is just part of the implementation, but they look like this. And as you can see, we're using internally uh, metadata about the component, about the elements. So. This enables a lot of other more powerful cases like this one where we are we have pattern matching with suspense and lazy so that the users will download only the component bundle that is matching a given condition. So if your browser doesn't support the sensor, uh, it's going to just download the fallback bundle. If it does, it's going to render this uh, component that is using the ambient light API. So to summarize, we're manipulating things based on the elements data and implementing pattern matching. If you'd like to check the source code of that or more examples, uh, I built a library uh, called React Matches using TS Pattern under the hood, uh, but it's not production ready. But if you're curious about it, you can definitely check. So if we go, uh, if we do a little bit of a recap here, Using fibers, React can pause, resume, and restart the rendering work of a component as new updates come in. And it can reuse some work that was completed in the past as well. And it can also split work into chunks and prioritize tasks based on their importance. And before we move forward to the next section, it's also interesting to learn about fibers in the wild. So, it turns out that Fiber is this generic model of execution where these units of work can work together in a cooperative way. And it turns out that they're a common resource in some operating systems and even in some programming languages like OCaml. And you, there's also this library called EffectTS, which is amazing. So I definitely recommend you to check out. Now moving on to coroutines. Um, I admit that one of the first things that tricked me into researching coroutines was this by Andrew Clark, one of the core committers of React. So he mentioned that React itself uh, basically motivated people to learn about immutability. And then Redux did that with high order functions. And then he said that Suspense would do the same, but with coroutines. So I started digging into definitions and etc. And one of the first things I found was that a coroutine is a generator or a producer that can also consume values. So from that definition, JavaScript generators, they can consume values, so they could be considered coroutines. Another definition I found is that a coroutine is a generator that can resolve a sync values, like a sync await. So this is one of the most, this seems to be one of the most common definitions of coroutines for in, in the JavaScript realm. And to be honest, if, if we think about it, before we had promises, a sync await and etc., we had Go and Bluebird implementing these on top of generators and even Bubble plugins would do the same. And last but not least, probably the most complex one is that a generator, uh, a coroutine is a generator that can mute with its tactful continuation. 
So uh, for now, let's think of this as we had deep uh, sink a wave and, or something like we have with suspense, for example, where we can pause the reconciliation work at any depth of our trade. So recapping in fibers, we have control pass through scheduler and this scheduler is what's going to determine what should be run next. So that's control at the level of the operating system or the framework, be it, for example, the Node.js event loop or React scheduler, etc. With coroutines, we have the control passed to the caller and handled at application code level. So let's get let's talk a little bit more about that in React. So the, they first appeared when the work on Fiber was going as a specific component type. So remember that we saw this huge list with different component types and etc. So we had also this coroutine component and this use component. So the idea here was, uh, as opposed to fibers, was to give components explicit control over yield and resumption. And I would definitely, by the way, recommend that you check the, the pull request around that because it's really interesting. But the thing in general didn't didn't quite move forward and the, the idea per se no longer exists. But I admit it's fascinating to think about which form they will take us there back to, to, to React. But we can also discuss coroutines in the context of concurrent React. So there's this very classic session by Dan Abramov uh, years ago where he was introducing uh, suspense for network bound components and time slicing back at the time for CPU bound components and time and he basically was introducing the whole umbrella of Confident React and the experimental things and etc. More recently, last year, uh, I had a chance to talk in React at React India about Confident React and a lot of things that enables the APIs, how it works on how it, the whole thing works under the hood and etc. And I'd like to grab some examples from that session. So back at the time with this, uh, we used this huge component where basically you can see that I'm typing on the right and on the left I, I have the results and you can see that it's very, very unresponsive. So because it's a very CPU, it's performing something that's heavily CPU intensive, I don't get any results and it starts lagging and suddenly Chrome itself crashes. So that's a terrible experience. So what's uh, behind this component is this resourceful operation function where basically I'm simulating uh, a very intense thing. So here I'm iterating from zero to a million and then returning that. And then I have my resourceful component consuming that. So how could we improve that? This takes us to our third experiment that is building a coroutines-based scheduler. For that, we'll grab some inspiration from Redux Saga. So in, in my opinion, Redux Saga was one of the most uh, brilliant middle-orders that uh, we ever had in Redux. And basically, it leveraged ESX generators to handle things like parallel execution, concurrency, race conditions, cancellation, and more. So back to our example, let's turn this into this. So what changed was first, our resourceful operation was promoted to a generator. And one of the first things we're doing is we have this while true loop and I, I know it doesn't look great, but the magic is that we're using execution back here. And then at the bottom of the code, we have this scheduler object and Scheduler has this function perform unit of work and this is where we're doing our concurrent things. So if we head back to the example, you can see that it's way faster and as I type, I have a nice fallback. It's responsive all the time. It's not laggy, so it's a way better user experience. So if we check the code, for the whole scheduler uh, object uh, we instantiated, it looks like this. And the key part is the perform unit of work function, where basically we're switching between three different states. So it can be idle, it can be pending, and it can be done. 
and the magic is that we're calling the next method of our iterator and the other magic thing is that we're throwing the promise at the end so that it suspends internally and you probably when you saw the, the, the final result here it sounds a lot like the use transition hook or the, the, trans, the whole concept of transitions that we have in React 18 and if we go back to the code Actually, yeah, we could rewrite the same example with transitions. So yes, we just simulated that, but using our own scheduler that we wrote with the idea of coroutines in mind. And that's kind of what we have in React. So we have this cooperative multitasking model where we have just one thread, but it can be it, the, the work of rendering can be interleaved with other tasks from the main thread, which includes also other React renders. And that's why an update can happen in the background without blocking response to the new input. So our example here, we had an original render task. I start typing, so that means user input, that means high priority. So it handles the high priority render task and then it resumes the original one and React internally use execution back to the main thread every five milliseconds, uh, so it's not using all the time like we did with our scheduler. And that's not a magic number. Basically, they do that because that's smaller than a single frame, even on 100 Chinese FPS devices. So that's why it doesn't block animation, and that's why it feels interruptible. Again, if you want to check uh, the whole session, is this 45 minutes, from the past reacted uh, in the edition, I would recommend it to. But we can move forward and talk about coroutines out there. And it's interesting because if we think about the async word in JavaScript, we, we know that a synchronicity, it's kind of what's called contagious. It means that, for example, if any function is async, then everything that calls it must also be async and so on until your entire code is async. And there's even a really good post about this kind of problem out there. It's called, what color is your function? It's a classic one and I would recommend you check it out. But back to JavaScript, synchronicity also isn't free. It comes with a cost and the cost is every async function call has to allocate callbacks and store them somewhere and take a trip back to event loop before invoking those callbacks. Really good and interesting example of the implications of this is SAS. So you're probably, uh, a lot of you are familiar with SAS. So SAS has mostly two functions for compiling SAS files. One that is sync and one that is async. And the async one became widely used uh, in practice because it enabled its sync plugins like the web access loader and that kind of thing. But the thing is for Node SAS, there was no performance issue because it was implemented in C++. But for Dart SAS that, that runs as pure JavaScript code, it was, job, it, it was subject to JavaScript async rules. So the result here was the async version in Dart SAS was two to three times lower than the sync one. And that's when they started using node fibers to implement async uh, code using the fast sync code, the async API using the fast sync code. Uh, that's not true anymore because this whole package of node fibers was deprecated a few years ago in 2021. But that's an interesting case of uh, using coroutines for you to check out outside of React. The next concept are effect handlers and they're basically an approach to reasoning about computational effects in pure context where we have an effect being a set of operations and its handler what's responsible for handling the semantics of how you implement the effect. And I know it sounds really hard so let's grab a practical example um, in F which is a language that has effect handlers out of the box. So here we're defining a user with the name and age. And here we're basically defining a lower fibers to implement async 
uh, code using the fast sync code, the async API using the fast sync code. Uh, that's not true anymore because this whole package of node fibers was deprecated a few years ago in 2021. But that's an interesting case of uh, using coroutines for you to check out outside of React. The next concepts are effect handlers, and they're basically an approach to reasoning about computational effects in pure context, where we have an effect being a set of operations, and its handler, what's responsible for handling the semantics of how you implement the effect. And I know it sounds really hard, so let's grab a practical example um, in F, which is a language that has effect handlers out of the box. So here we're defining a user with the name and age. And here we're basically defining the effects with the effect keyword and a type signature for that effect. So here we have get and set. And here we have our handler where we have three branches and all of them return a function. And the first case we're handling here is actually no effect at all. So it's when we reach the end of the block and Y is the return value. And here we're matching our effects get and set. And if we check a mod detail, K is what's called a continuation. And we'll talk more about that uh, soon. And basically it represents the rest of the computation after where we perform an effect. And even with the code, I know it's kind of a complex concept to get the grasp of. So luckily we have this post by them, Abramov, it's called algebraic effects for the rest of us. So in this post, he provides an example with what's called fictional JavaScript. So that's not valid JavaScript syntax, but basically we have this thing that looks like a throw try catch block. But here, instead of throw, we have this perform keyword. That means we're performing uh, an effect. And then instead of catching, we're handling this effect. And then we have this resume with that basically lets us jump back to where we first performed the effect. So what's interesting here is usually, um, if we, if we were to change something in the future uh, with promises, we're, we need to start handling then, and that requires changing things across everything because of how promises work in JavaScript, as we saw in the last session. With algebraic effect handlers, we can simply stop at the current process altogether until the effects are finished. So talking a little bit about effect handlers in React, we first see them mentioned in the layout algorithm. So apparently uh, years ago, they experimented a bit of using control structures that were inspired by effect handlers for managing layouts in React. And by the way, that's a really interesting reference for you to check this repo called React Future. Uh, it has a lot of historic value. And then moving forward, when they were revamping the context API as we know it, that the, the before React 16, they also did some experiments where they remodeled it using algebraic effects. By the way, you might want to check the RFC from back at the time. And then also we see experiments of handling side effects within a component and there's also this repo called React Basic. Again, it has a lot of historical value. And in this repo, you have this example by Sebastian Mockbosch, where you see a very similar syntax from the example proposed by Dan and Bramov years later. But so instead of row, we have raise, and instead of catching, we have catch effect. And then fast forward, we get the hooks API and Again, Sebastian points out that conceptually hooks can be considered algebraic effects. And it's a nice abstraction to think about because algebraic effects are the set of, are the set of operations and the set of handlers. So the operations here could be our hooks where we have, I don't know, 
use state, use effects, etc. And we have to, as we saw in F, the language, we have to set up these handlers on our own. But in React, it's kind of like they're part of the render cycle of our components. So here we have React responsible for much of the implementation of when and how our effects run. And that's great actually, because it allows, uh, it allows developers to, to be free from a lot of complexity uh, within, uh, and, and keeps this complexity within React itself. And then another great thing are the internals of suspense. So if you've ever built any API that under the hood is suspending something, I don't know, like the ones you would have for in React Fire or any library that is suspense compatible, you've probably seen this under the hood. So things like you're throwing promises. And this is again, another example from open source, but even, um, even in, in React Cache, for example, the experimental package, uh, you will see this pattern where you're throwing a promise. And that's exactly it. A component is able to suspend the fiber it is running in by throwing a promise. And this promise is caught and handled by React itself. And if we think about this for a second, it's the same throw handle resume pattern that we saw from effect handlers. And before we move forward, just like the others, you also have effect handlers out there. So we mentioned F, the language, but other languages like Coca, they have this concept out of the box. And even some other more popular languages like OCaml, in OCaml multi-core, you're gonna see this concept. And last but not least, continuations. So I love this quote from the GNU small talk continuation documentation. So it's like, it's a continuation described itself. So at my heart, I had something like the go-to instruction. My, create sets, my creation sets the label and my methods do the jump. However, this is a really powerful kind of a go-to instruction. And they go on. So that's basically what a continuation is. It's an abstraction that represents the remaining steps in the computation after we perform an effect. So just like other primitives, it's a control flow primitive, but it's not like go to, it's like a more powerful version. And in React, um, we, we also see them in, in PRs involving React. So for ex there's this example, um, Andrew Clark, for example, discussed continuations in the past. And again, that same repo, React Basic, you will also see mentions to continuations. And if we grab, for example, this popular part of the source that is perform work function that gets a deadline, what's happening here is it's handling a queue of tasks inside a while loop. And basically, if there are still tasks on the queue, it's going to return perform work and schedule it for resumption at some later point in time. So here in this function, basically we have the continuation of a queue of tasks. And that's not only React. So we have this main thread scheduling API that is uh, basically an umbrella of a lot of relevant APIs for, for scheduling on the web. And we also have muting and continuation described within this API. Uh, they even have really interesting examples of combining them all together, like using and then checking if there's, if the browser has input bindings to be processed and etc. I would recommend you to check out this, this API by the way. So you have continuations a lot out there and even in other languages as well. So just this framework for web development in small talk, it's called Seaside and Seaside is built around the idea of continuation and it brings them out of the box. So that's also a, like great relevant inspiration from other ecosystems. So a few closing notes before we say bye today.
Um, the first of them is that, yeah, React Fiber was this free ride of React that is focused on giving more low-level control over the program execution, where we had fibers as this low-level cooperative way to model execution of something, and we have algebraic effects as a way to handle those side effects and their behavior uh, in an independent way. Uh, another thing I kind of noticed is that it seems to me that React, the React team, they try to address the lack of some JavaScript language or features or language level resources in JavaScript and browsers, etc. by implementing some alternative solutions that give them similar behaviors. So the first time, for example, I saw that part of Suspense uh, worked by throwing promises and etc. That sounded to me like a really hacky solution. But if you think more about that, they grabbed inspiration for effect handlers, but they had to implement it in a language that didn't have them. And with continuations is a similar thing. And another thing is, I think that when we get to understand these concepts, uh, we get a better mental model for some of the React features and what they're doing behind the scenes. And I think that one example is when we get to abstract hooks uh, in terms of effect handlers. Uh, if you're coming from another ecosystem, if you're in your learning React from scratch and you can get the mental model of hooks as, as some alternative implementation of effect handlers, that's just great. And in a similar way, I think that when you understand these internals and the motivation behind them, I think we kind of learn how to build our own abstractions so one good example is the coroutines based scheduler that we build in the session or the, or the components for performing pattern matching, all of them understanding the, 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 the internals and, and using them, them to implement our own abstractions. Uh, for the next conclusion, I'd like to refer to this quote by Guillermo, the CEO of Versal, where he said a, almost a decade ago, he said that React was such a good idea that we would spend the rest of the decade exploring its implications and applications. And I think that we're here in a React conference discussing all of these uh, computer science topics kind of shows that React is this democratic agent for this kind of knowledge uh, in the front end world, where basically, um, we get to discuss things that we usually wouldn't be discussing in a front-end conference. So that's amazing for me. Uh, that's pretty much all we had to discuss today. Thank you so much. Uh, the Q, this QR code has the link for this, uh, for the slides of this session and as well to my social networks and the slides of other sessions I've presented on the area of performance and internals and etc. I hope you enjoyed it and it's great to be here at Great India. Thank you so much. Bye bye.